Well, thank you for the kind introduction, and um, I'm glad I got here by the skin of my teeth, thanks to uh, Delta Airlines. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, we're going to talk about some interesting things today and hopefully have some uh, time for questions. Uh, the title of the talk is there. Let's see if I can actually... Oh, there we go. So disclosures, uh, I'm chief medical officer of a company called Solera. Solera, if you remember, was a battle between um, Craig Ventner and Francis Collins to decode the human genome. So in 2001, the entire human genome was decoded, and, and this is the company that did it. The whole kit and caboodle has been purchased by Quest Diagnostics now, so that happened recently. Um, I'm involved clinically and academically in some places there. I have no relationships with drug companies, device companies, any, anything like that. Uh, my training was at uh, UC Davis, then 10 years at Stanford, 10 years at uh, UC Berkeley, and then uh, oh, eight or nine years back in Atlanta. So that's sort of the background. A man is only as old as his arteries. This was said by William Osler in 1892, who was a brilliant physician, of course, uh, but hit the nail on the head in terms of aging and the primary cause of death in our Western society. So if you're going to uh, do something different, uh, use a new test or a new method, you want it to do uh, several things. The first is to alter the diagnosis or the risk category you put your patient in. So everybody does a Framingham score. And can you make that better? The second is, uh, will the test alter a treatment decision? Would you use diet one or two or drug A or B? Uh, number three, which people don't think that much about, though, is would it help with compliance? If you give your patient some sophisticated information, are they more likely to maintain that weight loss or take their drugs? And, of course, the holy grail is, does it impact outcomes and have fewer events? <clears throat> so in terms of genetics, the American Heart Association has come out with a statement recently saying that um, this is really a major issue. And what we want to do is find physicians or institutions out there who would grab the bull by the horn and actually create centers that would guide the appropriate use of this very powerful information. Because sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's inappropriate. And we want these experienced centers to be created to help physicians and nurses practice this and particularly focus on families. So as you'll see in a minute, the power of a lot of this stuff is in families. And as you know, the most important risk factor for coronary disease at all is family history. Now we can do a whole lot of other things with that. So the agenda I'd like to go through in about the next uh, 35, 40 minutes is, number one, is there a need for any of this? Are we already doing a fine job and we don't need to pay attention to it? Can gene tests improve on what we're doing? Uh, how about genetics and non-invasive imaging? I know a lot of you use non-invasive imaging tests. Uh, fast CT, coronary calcium scores, carotid IMTs, that kind of stuff. What's its role in families? Do you treat families in your practice? And surprisingly, I'm going to end up telling you something about fish oil that will help clarify some of the recent uh, studies that you've seen, like the paper in JAMA a week or two ago. <clears throat> so to start this, I just want to review three concepts with you, which I know you're familiar with, but allow me to review them. One is relative risk reduction. And this is what you hear about all the time when you read the pharmaceutical studies about statin-1 or statin-2. Our drug has lowered risk 25 percent. Well, I'm, I'm a reviewer involved with 36 different journals. And we've now said, okay, if you make that statement, you have to use things like relative risk, if that's what you're talking about. And if you're saying something is significant, you need to say it's statistically significant. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. But a good friend of mine, Paul Williams, is the head statistician at UC Berkeley, and we go out and have a beer occasionally and stuff and talk about clinical trials. And he said, Robert, you know, we statisticians are, are just amazed at you doctors. You know, you run around and you see these papers that say this is significant, that is significant. And to us statisticians, it's mathematically or statistically significant, but that does not mean it's clinically significant or clinically relevant. So the use of the word significant from a statistician means that mathematically it's unlikely it's going to happen due to chance. To a clinician, it means, oh, it's important and I should do it. So remember that concept. So if you have 1,000 people in the control group, 1,000 people in the treatment group, you have 100 heart attacks in the control group, 75 heart attacks in the drug treated group, that's a 25% relative risk reduction, 100 versus 75. It's not 25% of 1,000. The absolute risk reduction is about 1%. <clears throat> so the issue there is have we done enough? 
So right away, some of you in the audience are saying, well, wait a minute, this guy's full of baloney. Um, I remember the Jupiter study. The Jupiter study proved that we got to get the LDLs down to 70, and we should basically put uh, this particular statin in the drinking water, and everybody should get their LDLs down, right? So here's the data from Jupiter, and just look at the upper left-hand uh, graph. And um, pa Paul Ritker created this, and down at the bottom, is there, oh, I guess I couldn't point. <laughs> um, down at the bottom on the x-axis is the years of follow-up, and the y-axis is the percent of people having events. And that first big graph is correct. It goes from zero to one on the y-axis, and that's what's supposed to do. Whenever you see blown up figures, always ask what happened to the y-axis. So the split of the two lines down there at the bottom is very, very small. So in order to help you see this, they blew it up, and that's the insert with the dotted red lines across the top there. So while there is a 43% relative risk reduction, there's a 1.2% absolute risk reduction. So this is now appreciated by a number of people. We, we first uh, published this in 1996 in a circulation article called Beyond LDL Cholesterol, which really got the drug companies pissed off at us because we said, hey, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be having that good of an effect. And so now this has caught on, and there are a whole number of people and groups saying, uh, yes, if you use Framingham risk scores or classic risk categorization, you miss a lot of people. These risk scores, like Framingham and Eric, are useful for population risk determination, particularly if I run a, want to write a paper, and God help me, I've done a lot of that. But what's the relevance for a single individual? They're not that good for a single individual. So we need more efficient tools. So to hammer that point home, this is data from Framingham. There's total cholesterol on the x-axis. The y-axis is HDL cholesterol. And there's two ovoids here. The solid ovoid are people with coronary disease. The hatched mark ovoid are people without coronary disease. The dot in the middle is the mean value. And you can see those people with coronary disease, the solid one, the total cholesterol is a bit higher and the HDL cholesterol is a bit lower. Absolutely true. Nobody's lying about this. The average cholesterol is higher and the average HDL cholesterol is lower. But look at the overlap. The problem is you can use this kind of analysis accurately if you're on the extremes. If your total cholesterol is very high or your HDL cholesterol is very low, you can accurately predict events. If you're in that mid zone, however, the overlap is so great, you make a mistake about 50% of the time. And I'm sure you're familiar with this recent article. This is the American Heart Association Get With The Guidelines. These were people <clears throat> coming into the emergency room, first time heart attack, had not had diagnosed coronary disease before that, about 136,000 people in this analysis, and 75% of them had an LDL below 130. You would not have identified them as needing therapy, and in fact, almost 25% had an LDL under 70. So this is a figure from our circulation paper, and there was an update one in 2008, if you want to read about how things have changed. And the, number, the name of the studies is on the x-axis down there, and there's two bars for each study. The height of the black bar is the percent of people having a cardiovascular event in the control group. The height of the hatch mark bar is the percent of people having a cardiovascular event in the drug-treated group. The difference in the heights of the bars are the people that are benefiting. So that's the 25% relative risk reduction. But what we've been talking about for years is all these people here who ha take the drug yet still have a coronary event, even though their LDL cholesterols are lower. So this um, sort of gets interesting when you talk about the history. So way back in the 1980s, we did the first cholesterol-lowering study ever to prove that lowering LDL cholesterol works. And you might not remember this. Only the old folks in the audience remember this. It was the LRC-CPPT, big NIH study, no drug money at all. Um, and we looked at high-cholesterol people and treated them with cholestyramine. And it was statistically significant by a one-tailed T-test. Not two tails, one-tailed T-test. Okay? So it was very slightly significant. And then the stats came on board. And when we designed that at the NIH years ago, we knew, high cholesterol, or we knew cholesterol was not the primary cause of heart disease. We knew high cholesterol was important. We also knew that medium-level cholesterols were not the cause of heart disease. So I want you to rethink some of that in terms of your approach to your patients because although a relative risk of 25% sounds pretty good, an absolute risk reduction of 1% to 3% is, if you pardon a sailor's term, it's pissing in the wind. <laughs>